I think the backstory of this movie is so interesting because you and Andy knew each other well before there was ever going to be a movie about your family's story. So I wonder if you can just explain how we got to the point where that came came to be uh, part of the relationship. Sure. Well, I, um, being a producer, uh, always looking for stories, it took me a bit of time to realize that I was sitting on rather an amazing story, the story of my own parents. And I uh, had w long wanted to create a movie, but uh, first of all, it was dependent on finding the right writer. And I saw a play called Shadowlands by Bill Nicholson, and I thought that is exactly the tone that I think the movie should have. <coughs> and I developed it for a, quite a long time with him, partly because when I asked him to do it and I told him the story, he said he'd love to do it on the condition that I didn't pay him <laughs> until and unless the film happened, which was a great result. And so for six or seven years, we developed it together whenever he was free from his other assignments and I was free. And we got it to a certain point. And at that point, to my great joy, Andy Circus and I had already formed a company called The Imaginarium. And Andy read the script. And to my huge joy, he said, he asked me if he could direct it. So I thought, yeah, definitely, no problem. Now, Andy, you've had people know you for such a long time for, for great acting and innovative acting and so much within that side of the business. But had your... Um, had you always had an interest in directing? What, you know, how far back does that go? Um, it actually goes back a very, very long way. Before I became an actor, I studied visual arts. So I always um, was very much in touch with trying to tell stories visually before, even before I became an actor. Um, and th over the course of, you know, 25, 30 years uh, dur during my, as my acting career was taking off, I started to make short films and uh, got involved, of course, after meeting Peter Jackson and working on Lord of the Rings, uh, the whole performance capture venture started. Um, so I started to direct performance capture for video games and, uh, um, and and other projects. And then Peter asked me to direct the second unit for The Hobbit, for The Hobbit trilogy, um, which was about the time that Jonathan and I formed the Imaginarium. Um, and then finally, uh, as we were laying out our stall of things that we wanted to make and formed this p performance capture studio and production entity at the same time, you know, it was very much with an idea that, that Jonathan would produce films that I would direct, and and this uh, this falls into that category. Although, and it's become my directorial debut, this film. But in actual fact, we'd already started working on another production, uh, The Jungle Book, which which we'd shot and was in post production. And there was this incredible window of opportunity when the most incredible two actors were available, and that one of them is sitting on my left, Andrew. Uh how did this first cross your radar, and was there a specific aspect of it that you just tapped into? You said, I, I have to do this. Um, it's, it's so magical. Um, I, I read this script, and it was unlike anything I'd ever read. That Bill Nicholson had somehow managed to take this life, this larger-than-life existence, and um, somehow contain it in a 120-page script. Um, and it didn't, f and it felt like, uh, I don't know, it felt allegorical. It felt like, um, it was, uh, it, it, I was, it was bigger. It, it just felt bigger than a whole life somehow. They managed, I think, in the, w how Bill wrote it, he managed to find all of the, uh, oh God, well, how do I, the, the, the cosmic, uh, mysterious, um, connection that these two people had and their connection to the world. Um, it, it, it went beyond two human beings, and I just sobbed. I just kind of read read this thing and, and sobbed and 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 laughed and sobbed and laughed and you know interchangeably and sometimes both at the same time. And I I kind of saw a template of how to live. I thought, well, God, I want my life to feel like this. So maybe maybe by apprenticing to Robin and uh, I, I it can rub off on me. And then I and then I spoke to Andy and. He, that was just a wonderful conversation. He put he put any fears or kind of concerns I had at rest. And I uh, had a dinner with Jonathan in in this city. We went to a wonderful restaurant called Animal. I don't know if you've been, <laughs> but I'd recommend it if you're not vegetarian. Um, and uh, I I met I met a, an embodiment of these two people. I met I met what these two magical people created, and they created another an, another magical person. And I thought, well. 
a few months with this person would be a lovely time. And um, what an honor if, if he ultimately wants me to play his father. What, a, what an honor. I want to ask Jonathan and Andy if you can tell us about the other key element of the film who's not here, uh, Claire Foy. I think it's amazing that, you know, now it's, I think now it's like, uh, it's obvious and the cool choice if you can get Claire Foy to do anything after The Crown, uh, you know, you do it. But this was before anyone had seen any of that. So how did you guys realize that she was right for, for this part? Pick her out of a lot of other people who I'm sure would have wanted to do it. Well, I think the first time I sort of saw her, I've ha- I mean, Andy's actually worked with her before and uh, knew her well personally and knew her work probably better than me. I went to some awards ceremony and the very first trailer for The Crown was shown because somebody was getting some award who'd worked on it. And I looked at Claire playing the Queen, and my mother is a, a not unregal figure. And I went, oh, my God, that, that's a version of my mother. That's extraordinary. Um, so we then very quickly met her, and it was very clear to both of us that, you know, not only is she an extraordinary, extraordinary person and an amazing actress, but that she had some of the things in common with my mother, beauty, bravery, living in the moment, which is, I think, a critical shared thing, not looking back, not looking forward, just being there, bang, bang, plonk in the moment, which um, is something we'd all like to learn to be, I think. Andrew, I want to ask you, I know from just uh, various things I've read that there was a lot of work that went into this before the cameras ever started rolling for you. Um, Obviously, this is uh, you know, you don't see too many people uh, with with polio and what that comes with these days. So if you can just talk about the the sort of preparation that you did, which I n- believe extended even to dental related uh, <laughs> items, which you can I'll leave that to you to explain. Yeah, I mean, as soon as it was all go and and Jonathan decided and Andy decided that this was the right thing, I I just kind of I just. You know, it was like going to university for Robin Cavendish studies, uh, and I had about two and two and a half months of uh, of getting to know him by osmosis. That's c- kind of my favorite part of the acting process is that that preparation period where there's no obligation to get anywhere, where you just get to swim around and spend time in the in the library, as it were. Um, and so, with that came time with Jonathan, time with Andy, uh, time with. Uh, people who are living currently on ventilation on ventilators on external ventilators um, doctors my brother's a doctor in London he introduced me to a couple of patients of his and uh, and the remarkable thing about that one of the remarkable things about that is that every single patient I spoke to had some connection to Robin and Diana whether it was a direct connection or whether they were just aware that their lives had been changed by these two people's bravery, arguably idiocy, and kind of, uh, you know, they're the, the diving headfirst into, you know, putting Robin in, 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 in danger in order to fully live his life. So that was remarkable. Um, uh, and then, of course, there's the technical challenges, and that I worked closely with Andy and, and Jonathan about that. I had one recording, we had run one recording of your father later on in his life where the croak in his voice became very... Um, thick so I we decided well let's work backwards and we so we, we start with a clearer voice and then we end up in that very kind of deteriorated place and then the, the rhythm of the breathing machine obviously that very unnatural consistent rhythm um, uh, kind of adhering to that creating that for myself was really really interesting and then of course you know being paralyzed you you have all these bodily impulses and the only part that can move is my face so that was wonderful I got to be very unself conscious of my face for once in my life doing a film you know I kind of we kind of broke all the rules of what you know film acting is in a way it's like you know less is more actually you know for Robin more was more he wanted you to know what he was thinking and feeling because and the only way he could do that you know he, he couldn't put his arm on you he couldn't he couldn't give you a hug but he could he could he could do it with his um you know his soul through his eyes and through his face so anyway that's just scratching the surface but it was a, a true privilege to work on this role, and it continues to be to talk about Robin in this way. 